Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. This is a treat. It's uh, a commonly uh, <coughs> thought that CCS has been around and people have been talking about it for, for a while. That's not true. I was, for a while, a very unpopular figure at gathering of my former oil industry colleagues because of exactly the material I'm going to talk about now. Now, at um, terrible pain to me if I don't present this summary of the lecture. It seems to me it spoils it a bit, but there you are. Uh, I'm going to say two things, and one of them I'm going to say with utter confidence is based on the rocks, <coughs> and that is that we really do have a problem with climate change. And I'm going to say that on the strength of geological observations, quite independently of any climatological arguments with which any one of you individually may have found reason to quarrel over the years as those have developed. Do I believe in those climatological arguments of the uh, uh, poor old Phil Jones and the others? Yes, broadly I do. We've had the pleasure of having these people, including Phil, here talking to us about these things, and by and large I think the science, the observational science they've got is sound. The models may be less so. But I'm going to say something that I hope you will find utterly convincing based on rocks that says we really do have a huge problem with what we are doing now, dumping carbon into the atmosphere. And of course, we this morning represent the dreaded agents in the eyes of many, the villains who are taking this fossil carbon out of the ground and putting it into the atmosphere. Do I feel bad about the role I played over the years in that and encouraging uh, my students in my times in the academic world to go and join the oil industry? Not a bit of it. We didn't know. Now we do, and we need to start behaving differently. Not in a hangdog way, but as we always do when we're at our best, looking for a massive business opportunity. And in the second part of my talk, I'm going to argue <coughs> And it will here be an argument that's much more open to doubt and question. Many of the issues have already been raised here in the excellent talks we've had this morning. But I'm going to set out for you the scale of the opportunity that we, the industry, have once we're convinced there's a problem, and crucially, once the public at large and our political leaders are convinced there's a problem, then there will be the creation of an economic atmosphere which will lead to the development of the industry I'm going to propose to you. And so to come directly to the one-line summary in answer to Julian Rush's question, I'll do it for $50 a tonne of CO2 safely stored. And I'll have to give a good chunk of that to my buddies who capture it, but I'll take a nice profit on that. And that price should not be beyond the reach of our leaders. So the first part of this, the bit I'm really confident about, the bit I'd swear in the court of law beyond reasonable doubt, is that you can't argue with the planet. And uh, as we know, the planet does leak naturally fossil carbon. Here's my colleague from Trax, Keith Davison, demonstrating the properties of Pitch Lake to some admiring uh, tra industry trainees. Here are the, uh, the eternal fires of, um, on the northern flank of Kamaki Valley, north of Baku gas escaping. Uh, that's not the burning fires of Babylon, that's bitumen on the smaller bit of brick used by Nebuchadnezzar to build Babylon, and that's his uh, script saying Nebuchadnezzar's the king, roughly translated, on the bit on the left. Uh, uh, it, there is still some of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, building left, though Saddam, in one of his probably better acts, though it still looks ghastly, built on top of it. Now, that's oil and gas coming out of the ground. <clears throat> um, today, about 12,000 or so barrels will <coughs> leak out of the earth from natural seeps, about uh, maybe as much as 25% of that in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, today, as we all know very well in this room, we will pump something like 80 million barrels of oil out of the ground in what we hope is ruthlessly controlled operations. This is an old-fashioned rock. It's the Hertfordshire Pudding Stone. If, as I would really like, we weren't all sitting in this beautifully aired, luxurious lecture theatre, 
but 25 miles north of here in the sparkling Hertfordshire countryside I left a few hours ago, we could go and see the Hertfordshire Pudding Stone. It's a rock that's 55 million years old, that age is important, and it was uh, formed originally on a beach. You can see there this lovely shingle, rounded pebbles with a gleaming tropical white quartz sand to get between your toes and between the pebbles, then cemented with a silica cement in a pretty drastic regional warming event that we date in old-fashioned geological terms at about 55 million years. The world changed, the geological world changed hugely in the last century for two reasons. One was Vine and Matthews and the magmatic, magnetic stripes and plate tectonics. And the other, perhaps less famous but probably at least as important, was Nick Shackleton, John Imbrie and the others enabling us to divide geological time on a human time scale, thousands rather than millions of years. And here's the core taken from beneath the floor of the deep North Atlantic, Western North Atlantic. Uh, that is described in a remarkable paper by Norris and Roll, published in Nature in October 1999. This is a section through 55 million years ago, and it shows, in a way you can't argue with, how the planet changed 55 million years ago when something at least 1,000 gigatons of carbon was released into the atmosphere, obviously long before we were around to do as much as light a campfire. In the extinction that followed, our distant ancestors, the primates, appeared, so we are, all of us here this morning, uh, an ultimate direct uh, beneficiaries of that event, but I'm going to suggest to you now that unless you want to take part in a comparable experiment which will lead to our replacement, uh, we should stop what we're doing now. So, what did happen? That's the summary from Norris and Roll. Um, I'll show you a graph in a moment showing that you actually can't separate the two curves, and it does take about 200,000 years for the Earth to clear its throat. What we now also know, and has been published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature and established beyond reasonable doubt subsequently, is that this 55 million year event has other comparable events that preceded it, and each time you press the button, you get much the same outcome. So here we are, here's the graph. Now, uh, we're not allowed to do book promotions in Piccadilly. I was advised by my friend Tony the other day uh, because of security concerns. So, <laughs> so I'm modestly not stacking up here piles of uh, the very well-reviewed book Challenged by Carbon, uh, published at a modest price by Cambridge University Press. <laughs> But when I was trying to draft this figure, which turns out to be, as I stagger around the racetracks, as Dave reminds you, the racetracks and the pubs trying to convince the punters of the science of this uh, and its importance, um, I wanted to have a graph that plotted our input of carbon on the same scale, the same graph as the natural input 55 million years ago, and I couldn't separate it. So what you've got there is a cross on the steep curve going up, and and let's just take a moment to look at this. Um, these are pretty hard data. This is observational science. Uh, subsequently revised, uh, but the, 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 all the main numbers, the proportions of the main numbers, uh, I stand by in the wake of the uh, decade of research subsequently. You'll see on the uh, upper horizontal axis, time divided on the Nick Shackleton time scale the human time scale, thousands of years, uh, with a resolution of thousands of years. The input uh, of carbon is shown on the vertical axis in gigatons, and the elapsed time is shown in thousands of years on the lower horizontal axis. So you'll see a steep input of um, cumulative input of over 1,000 gigatons 55 million years ago, and that carbon slowly being drawn down, that asymptotic solid curve, drawing it down so you're just about back to 
to the baseline again after a couple of hundred thousand years. And there, 300 gigatons, I chose that figure conservatively, but we can take that as the minimum amount that we, through our ingenuity, uh, spreading wealth as we've gone along the way, we, the oil industry, have been responsible, along with our buddies in the coal industry, for lifting out of the ground and putting into the atmosphere uh, about 300 gigatons of carbon in the same short interval that three times that amount was put into the atmosphere 55 million years ago. And that's what happened. I said a moment ago, perhaps we would consider we did not wish to repeat this experiment. It's a cliché, but it was an old cliché that we carry out an experiment, we don't know the outcome. Well, that's not true. Uh, if you're allowed to argue by analogy, and my old bosses in Harvard would be livid to hear me doing this, but I think the analogy is quite a good one. This is what happened last time, is what I should say. And the oceans becoming notably more acidic is one of those consequences that is not given enough attention, particularly uh, says he at danger of being summoned before the High Court of the Royal Society in a recent report on geoengineering by the Royal Society, which largely, from my reading of it, seemed to ignore the fact that you may control the temperature of the planet by reflecting heat from the sun back into space, but the acidity will go up if you pump carbon, the acidity of the oceans will go up if you pump the carbon into the atmosphere. And the extinctions I've referred to. Now, we've got a number of questions, and this is a reality lecture here. You can press your buttons and make a choice about what you want to hear about. Um, or do you would you like me to decide for you? Uh, hectoring, do you want to repeat the 55 when you're warming? I find in the pubs and racetracks that if I stop now and have a game of darts or pick up the racing post or have a pint of Guinness, then more people will believe what I've said than if I go on and go into my John the Baptist mode and say, and therefore you should believe this. So I just leave the observations from 55 million years ago with you. Do we know it'll be the same this time around? No. I mean, it'd be a really unscientific comment to say, yeah, we all would be just the same. I will repeat, we do have this intriguing body of evidence building up that every time you pull this carbon trigger and you put about a thousand gigatons into the atmosphere, you seem to get pretty much the pattern we saw at 55 million years. And for those of you who'd like to learn more of that, there will be one of the more imp important meetings we've held in this room for some years is going to be held here 2nd, 3rd November. It's on carbon isotope excursions. It's organized by Anthony Cohen and Jonathan Cowie. Uh, Bob May is going to be there, and Bob and I will, I hope, be uh, getting a decent audience at a media event subsequently. But there will be a science meeting with a media event clearly separated. Do I have the experiences of some of my climatological colleagues in mind when I insist on that separation? You bet I have. Right. Um, curious, what caused the 55 million year event? If I'd asked uh, Bamford, am I allowed to talk about this? You said, no, God, no, no hot blobs, but I don't care. You're now going to get an intense uh, academic summary of my latest research. Um, if you want to go and have a pee and phone your mum, you don't want to hear about scientific research, now's your chance. In five minutes' time, I'm going to come back and talk about the belligerent question. But for now, you're going to get some paleogeographical maps. There you are. There's uh, Britain and Ireland under the chalk sea. The evidence is on, the, on your left, the, uh, the interpretation is on your right. I was enabled to uh, draft these maps uh, while I was waiting to debate with uh, Michael Ancrum, the eventual winner, and Gordon Brown, who ran second in the by-election, no, the parliamentary election that Dave referred to in Edinburgh in 1979. It was right around that time, a little earlier, when I became the prospective candidate for Edinburgh South, that our industry started generating enough data from offshore for us to draw these maps with confidence for the first time. And these Arthur Ransom efforts, of which I remain intensely proud after all these years, 
uh, here's, here's the uh, early Cenozoic map. Now, there's the data on the left. The igneous rocks in the north and west, the soft rocks down here in the south. By the way, if you wanted to be president of the Geological Society or um, one of the other geological bishops uh, in a previous era, the Episcopalian succession ran through that uh, igneous province in the northwest of the country. If you hadn't studied the layered ultra-basic intrusion, or slightly less good, some of the nearer surface rocks in that province, forget it, Sonny. Uh, uh, Right-hand side is the paleogeographical map, and right up in the North Sea, you'll see our beloved 40s formation being fed by, um, uh, by a nice river system. Uh, a recognizable outline of Britain and Ireland emerging, and what we have learned since I drew these maps, and this is relevant to the science I'm talking about today, is that this movement out of the Chalk Sea did not take place in one fell swoop. We'd always thought it had. <coughs> but because we've had the advantage, we, the industry, of looking at our own rocks in the North Sea, all, we all know that the sands came in impulses and therefore the uplift of Scotland was impulses. And one of those pulses took place 55 million years ago. So here you've got the North Atlantic at that time, inset top right, is the uh, uh, White and Mackenzie view of the influence of the early Iceland plume at that stage. And um, a preferred location for the centre of that plume is shown as WM89, Cambridge loyalty coming through here. J, uh, west of Shetland, and B, east of Shetland, are Judd and Bresse, respectively. Well known to, I imagine, to most here. And I'm going to show you a river system, 55 million year old uh, river system um, taken from a time slice from the 3D seismic data in the Judd Basin. Uh, this river system is extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, I'm going to show it in a, uh, next week at the William Smith meeting in introducing that uh, and I think you could almost claim it as a contemporary system. The importance of it for the arguments I'm conducting this morning about what triggered the 55 million year event is that underlying that surface are rocks we can date closely that are marine and overlying it are rocks we can date closely that are marine and we can work out the topography on that and so we can work out that this surface went up at least 490 meters and then went down more than that all within the space of a million or two years. And that of course is geologically exceptionally rapid. It has to be vertical movement. It cannot be caused by compression. And here, and I don't get into the detail on this, I merely refer you to um, an article in the Journal of the Geological Society published in recent weeks. Uh, Left-hand side, Judd area, right Bresse, and there's a gap. There's an unconformity. It's bigger in the west, smaller in the east. It's earlier in the west, later in the east. This gap, we think, uh, this mapping, I should say, is Max Shaw Champion. The modelling is John Rudge. Uh, Nikki White led the research team. And uh, uh, Dan McKenzie was finally convinced by our argument, so he's on the second paper. And what we think happened was a hot blob came out of the middle of the... came up the stem of the Iceland plume, moved out sideways, lifted up Judd first, dropped it down again as it went on like a rat running under a carpet, went on to Scotland, lifted up Bresse, and as it went under Scotland and lifted up Scotland, um, there it is, there's the model for it. I really won't dwell on it, um, but there is the, the hot blob making its way across the North Atlantic. As it did so, it lifted up that land surface 55 million years ago, and there you see the river feeding 40s formation. 40s formation was deposited, we are pretty confident, as a result of this hot blob passing underneath Scotland. So east of Scotland form one of our favourite wonderful oil fields. West of Scotland in the nascent North Atlantic Ocean, we suspect methane hydrates were destabilised by the passage of this hot blob and precipitated the 55 million year warming event. So this blob gave us 40s formation in the age of innocence 
And now, in the age, I hope, of increasing awareness, it's given us the best geological evidence bearing on the origin, we suggest, good geological evidence bearing on the origin of the 55 million year warming event, which I'm commending to you today as the ultimate warning that we, the industry, now need to take this as an established fact and start reacting to it instead of holding back through trepidation about the science. So let's start coming to what we can do about this. 40s core. Um, the earlier picture I showed you was of uh, 40s alpha, which we flew over beautiful morning in May 1982 when... Um, John, had you yet been press ganged into BP then? You weren't involved in, you were just about to join, I think. It's but uh, it was the EOR, it was the, EOR um, the oil was then at its, uh, what I think is still its historically high real price. And um, Basil Butler was convinced by some of us that it would be a good idea to put soap down one well and see what came out of the other. And we, we thought this would be great fun. So we went off, uh, we were coring. 40s Delta, well, 52, and that is the uh, designer reservoir that is 40s. Can the oil industry help? The price is what we've been talking about. And my offer of uh, 50 bucks a ton, uh, a ton is there on the table. So let's just consider what expertise we're going to bring to this. Um, these are some nice nostalgic uh, pictures. I've got, still got it, a Roll I-35B, no battery in it. So I could go anywhere and take these pictures without all the, uh, uh, all, all, all the necessary permissions. Here we are taking this core. Uh, here the... Um, this is why I was asking John if he was there. I wonder if he's hiding under one of these um, orange uniforms. These guys are getting pretty dirty here. Plenty of mud, plenty of oil. Um, and uh, they're preparing this so the smiling chief can sit there um, practicing his uh, vote for me smile uh, and uh, here on the deck at my feet are these uh, uh, beautifully wrapped cores for which we are studying for enhanced oil recovery and these are among the, the uh, scanning electron uh, microscopes of the 40s there's quite a bit of diagenesis in there quartz cybergrove <laughs> Kaolinite booklets, little bits of wispy alike. God, you're saying the old boy's lost it. Where does he think he is? Does he think he's in the lecture hall in Cambridge? <laughs> no. The point is this. None of what I've said seems to you exceptional. Yeah? You're, you're used to this. This is what we do. We've gone through a huge amount of the science and the technology we need to have gone through to make a massive contribution to storing CO2 safely underground. What I'm talking about now is just one piece of research that was done in one company at one stage. You add all that up. You look simply in the publications of the Geological Society and the AAPG uh, at the, 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 the volume of material that's being produced on this. We have scholarship and we have technology. We know how to do it. Now, there's one particular angle on this that I rather like. And this was an obsession of mine many years ago, and it was the development of secondary porosity. That is, a natural acid flux of a subsurface uh, reservoir, uh, a sandstone reservoir, with the acid flux, which we believe preceded the migrating oil, etching out the felspars. You can see the remnants of a potassium felspar in the, uh, in the upper right sketch there and creating oversized pores that clearly are not original. The suggestion with CCS is that we inject an acid uh, into a reservoir, and the argument I'm developing here is a pretty obvious one, that we know quite a lot about the natural uh, effects of doing this, we have not, as far as I'm being aware from the discussions I've had with my colleagues in West Texas, and particularly in AAPG, with whom we're running a joint event here on CCS next year, 
As far as I know, we haven't yet studied very much what's happened in the fields of West Texas where we've been injecting CO2 for some time, but we could find out. We can do more or less anything. We're good at this stuff. And there's a possibility here, though the kinetics are alleged to be unfavorable, there's some work being done by Stuart Hazeldean and the team at uh, my old university in Edinburgh and others that suggest that some of our um, ideas on the kinetics may have been a little bit pessimistic. It may be possible for us, collaborating with our colleagues, the petroleum engineers, to actually create our own pore space, downflow to create our own seals, to take aquifers and engineer them to our own purposes <coughs> and make them safe so we're not talking about 1% leakage every 1,000 years. The point is an absolutely important one. I think, I suspect that John Gross may say a little more about it, but you're, you're, <coughs> without necessarily agreeing with all of your figures, we have to do something that's really very, very safe here. What's the scale? Well, I'm, you'll see right away coming at this from a rather different angle from the pragmatic approach being taken by the earlier speakers. Uh, if you take the figures uh, of uh, Robert Pakula, uh, Robert um, Sokolow and Stephen Pakula, and the, the Princeton publications on this, just to hold the line on our carbon release, we've got a not release, 175 billion tons over the next 50 years. And uh, you can do the sums on that, leading to the conclusion in the second bullet. Uh, the third bullet follows. But if so, 80 million barrels come to the surface today, no, 300 million, we all know that. Um, if we were to reverse the total fluid flow we're going to bring to the surface of this planet today, in the form of CO2, we would cope with most of the Princeton target. Now, that isn't going to happen. Uh, I would hope that we would make the transition to a proper low carbon economy where we didn't have to pay the penalties of fossil fuel extraction and coal extraction as rapidly as possible. But the realistic view on this is that we are going to continue the United States and India and China in particular are going to continue to burn an awful lot of coal and we need to capture that and put it on the ground. Um, this slide is almost old fashioned in its very title uh, but I'm keeping it in here because I want to make a point about how, to repeat the point that was made earlier about how fast things are developing. So. This uh, is uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, um, on the first visit I made, uh, uh, what well, this is this is Saigon. This is the downtown of Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, in '97, that street was filled with bicycles. Um, this is um, a, a picture taken some eight years later and you'll see the bicycles being replaced by scooters, uh, and there are a few cars, including the BP truck in which I'm sitting there like Lord Muck with the air conditioning on. So who's going to hit this target? Well, let's say that the, um, our United States uh, cousins are going to cut their per capita output of carbon in half. I agree, it's not going to happen. Uh, if they did that, if they had done that, uh, I'm afraid that would already have been cancelled out by China. And that is predominantly, it's not the cars on the streets of Beijing, though they're the obvious part of this, and they are responsible for the major part of the increase in the consumption of our products. The main topic here is the coal. And the main business opportunity for us is the coal. We had a debate here in 2003 between BP and ExxonMobil, uh, which I thought was going to be a lot more of a fist fight than it was. There was um, uh, 
ExxonMobil turned out to be already moving towards their present position, which is not that different, I suggest, from that of the other majors. Moody Stewart, in summarizing that debate, made these three points, and I think they stand absolutely. The second one is really remarkable. Maybe we're a little bit more used to it now, because this is 2010, but in 2003, here was a captain of our industry standing up and pleading for government regulation. Now, it's the belief that we're going to get that regulation that inspires me to offer to do the burial for 50 bucks a tonne, because I think there is a way of convincing our leaders that we have the problem, and I've given you that argument. I don't think anybody in this room really thinks it's going to be the first. I mean, we've, 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 we've had a bad year. We've had an accidental release. I mean, the, well, let me go back. We all know the loss of life in that incident outweighs any other analysis. But if I may be allowed to say that and then move to the, some of the environmental implications of, of the Deepwater Horizon blowout, um, the estimate of the release of oil from that, be that constrained or <coughs> captured or otherwise, is about an order of magnitude greater than the natural flux into the Gulf that's going on week by week and, and month by month and year by year, which of course was not a, a popular thing to say anywhere, even on the racetracks or in the bars, while this thing was going on. But we're not going to lose permission to operate as an industry on the strength of that incident or others. And I suspect it's not going to be because we run out of oil. We're going to manage a transition. And I'm going to leave you with a, a piece of technology that was more vital to our Stone Age, one of our Stone Age ancestors, uh, than gasoline is to us. This is the part of a Artifact, pudding stone artifact, Hertfordshire pudding stone artifact, 55 million years old, cemented at the time of the great Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, we think. And um, here's the lower surface, which you can see is, is worn. This was uh, used possibly as a hammer as well as for grinding corn, but it's a, a device for grinding corn, an essential piece of technology. Um, uh, a fellow geologist, Jane Tubb, found this when she and I were discovering, hard by the present-day A-10, choked with vehicles, uh, the copse that now marks the site where our Stone Age ancestors and the Romans quarried this stuff. There isn't an awful lot of rock in Hertfordshire that can be quarried to make millstones. And we were, we'd found this quarry and we found this, this artifact there. These people, these ancestors, you can go and sit up there and look at the traffic on its way to Stansted Airport and think about their transition and our transition. I think the transition we have to make, given the knowledge we, the industry, have and the skills we have, is not daunting when we compare it with the transition made by these ancestors of ours. Thank you. Any questions? I actually stunned everybody. Okay, thank you again, Brian. And uh, <laughs> I'd just like to record that Brian did that talk completely without notes. Sure. <laughs> and my apologies, I have to go upstairs now and um, in chair some meetings. I would rather be with you. One more question. What's the yes. chance of another hot blob? <laughs> what, what's the probability of another? Is it not? Another hot blob? Yeah. Uh, they're all over the place now. Uh, the, the surface of the planet now is high in some places, low in other places because of the hot blobs. So, what's the chance of a hot blob um, coming 
coming across where there is methane hydrate stored in quantity underneath the ocean? I should think it's very good. If we don't trigger the release of those methane hydrates, the hot blob will. This is the wonderful thing about being a geologist. You can be so lofty. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to say, I was, uh, when I was raising my own children, I think we all recognize our own children are pretty ghastly. But when the grandchildren come, then it's different. And then I stopped being so lofty. Uh, that was around the time I read the Norris and Roll paper. And incidentally, the time coincidentally when I was working on the hot blobs. Yeah, I mean, there will be um, a trigger in favourable circumstances by some mechanism or an, another of another warming period. Stability is not an option. I mean, one of the, one of the problems that uh, Plymer has in his book, and it is a massive problem, is that he, his book is written on the old geological time scale. So he looks at the warming event at 55 million years and completely gets it wrong. If you're listening in, you've got it completely wrong. And he, understandably, because not everybody's spending every hour poring over the very latest paper coming out that recalibrates these things. So our natural skepticism as geologists is now tempered by this time scale. We also know as geologists that some combination of episodic events, volcanic, and periodic events, astronomical orbital control, is going to change Earth's climate, whatever we do. What we're doing, to me, appears to be, and I hope to you now, appears to be quite clearly an episodic input of carbon on a scale that must lead to a warming event. Either it will prime the system so the next time we go through a Shackleton orbital warming, then the methane hydrate and the boreal hydrates are released, or it'll do it on its own score. We're still not quite sure what the balance is between the periodic and the episodic, but it is, is a distinction I commend to you at Leopardstown Racetrack, Sandown Racetrack, uh, the Mill Stream Pub in Hartford, anywhere, you've got somebody who quite properly is sceptical about the anthropogenic climate change argument because they say, oh, it's happened all the time. Sure, we know that better than anybody. It's just that what we're doing turns out to be so big, it's a third of the way to repeating the episodic blast that we're pretty confident triggered the 55 million year warming event. Now, there will be those in this room who study these events more carefully than I. Um, and there are subtleties and difficulties and complexities. And in November, we will be having, no doubt, lots of arguments in this room about whether, for example, the 183 million year Jurassic warming event was triggered by periodic Shackleton type changes or an episodic volcanic event. I think Anthony Cohn is going to argue it's primed by the volcanic event and then triggered by a Shackleton event. For the purposes of the discussion, I presented today, it doesn't matter. What we're doing is on just such an unambiguously amazing scale that uh, we're going to do it. We're going to have a hot blob effect. So would you think that we need two solutions? One, is, one of which is to deal with the um, carbon dioxide being released from coal and to a lesser extent from oil, but a secondary solution being to be able to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere from some other you know, periodic, episodic, whatever one likes to call it, events. Uh, were James Lovelock here, he would argue that we've already gone so far, uh, and I think James Hansen would argue also, that we need to take, never mind stopping the dump, we need to take it out as well. If that really is the case, then we'll take it out and we will collectively bury it. So the need for us to prime ourselves as an industry on an heroic scale to do this is in the arguments of some of the uh, people, uh, Lovelock, Hansen and others, we should already be doing that. The transition, the transition was beautifully brought up in the presentation immediately before the break. We have to manage this transition. Now, in the ideal world, if Jeremy Leggett were in this room, he'd be up here with his hands round my throat saying, for God's sake, Lovell, same old stuff, trying to protect the fossil fuel industries. Why don't we just invest in solar and make the big leap now? And that's the idealistic viewpoint. And I think... <laughs> I, 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 
I, I'm sorry, that was not meant to sound like a, a put down at all. In, in, the, in the good world, that's what would happen. You, we wouldn't have to go through this stage. I think that even if we're detached in our view of our own industry and the coal industry, we have to recognize that there's so much inertia in the world's energy supplies. Any kind of sensible projection of where we're going to protect our standard of living as the population grows by another two, three billion, we're going to have to keep burning coal to get the electricity. And let's face it, gasoline and gas are pretty handy substances. We know that. We make a lot of money out of it. And I think we should keep doing that. So I think we should capture as much of the CO2 from the coal as we can. We should be well paid for it. And the argument, the economic argument for that that overrides any other consideration is that if we don't start doing that, we're going to pay a heavier price. So the legacy for the grandchildren becomes a real environmental mess against which our capital investment in a bit of infrastructure to transport the CO2, to drill the wells, to improve the wells, to withstand the acid CO2 if a bit of water gets in, all this stuff that we can do, that investment will be blessed by that. We can be heroes. <laughs> Good thought. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.